showed today is hit a little bit of correlation and regression. We try to go through the lab. We're going to talk about some examples of doing the math. We'll use Excel to demo some of the math just to make sense of what's going on. Hopefully this is a pretty straightforward idea. I know we're coming off of a topic that can be a little more uh, difficult to understand. So hopefully this one clicks a little bit. It really goes back to what you learned probably in high school, whether or not it stuck with you. If you remember slope equations, regression is a slope equation, right? So the whole rise over run, y equals mx plus b, all that type of stuff is going to come into play here. So let's first just talk about conceptually, what is it that we're trying to do with correlation and regression? Well, if you remember, we've talked about different types of analyses are suited for different types of data. And when you're talking about correlation and regression, you're talking about looking at the relationship between variables that are on continuum in general form. Now, there are subtypes of both regression and correlation that if you continue, you know, you'll learn, oh, well, there are types of regression for different types of data. You know, you have logistic and you have, you know, ordinal logistic and multinomial and all these other types of regression. We are talking about linear regression or ordinary least squares linear regression. And this is kind of the, the when someone just says regression, they give you nothing else. This is what they're talking about. And we're talking here about Pearson's correlation. Um, we'll talk about a couple other types of correlation in this class that can be used for different types of data. But in general, when people just use the terms regression or correlation, we're talking about this idea of relating two variables that are on scales, right? So the numbers are real numbers. Uh, they have the potential not only to be one's higher than the other, but that they're equidistant, right? Uh, so again, once data is kind of on that scale of measurement, of interval ratio, we normally say, hey, that's good enough. But we're not talking about dealing with groups here. We're not talking about ethnicity, um, which is, you know, would fall into separate discrete groups. Now, like I said, we'll talk about other types, but I think this is important because so far the analyses we've learned have focused on having groups in some level. You know, t-tests, you have two groups for an independent sample t-test. Um, and when you talk about ANOVAs, you know, you have multiple groups. What happens if you have a predictor, an independent variable? In the context of regression, we'll talk about it as a predictor more because you can't really have a true independent variable in regression. Because if you remember, independent variables in true methodological sense are variables that are manipulated by a researcher um, and to which individuals are randomly assigned to the levels or conditions within that independent variable. You can't do that when it's on a continuum. I can't randomly assign people to an infinite number of possible values, right? That doesn't work. So here, most of the time we're dealing with data that aren't experimental. Uh, correlation and regression are often used to just relate things that are measured, right? Not manipulated. So the difference between measured variables and manipulated variables. I can measure your height. I can measure your weight, right? And when I do that, I can correlate those and I can say how are height and weight related. For example, does your weight go up on average if your height goes up, right? That might be a reasonable hypothesis, right? But I can't really manipulate. I can't randomly assign people to be a certain weight. Okay, so number one here is these base forms. Base forms, by that I mean again, Pearson's correlation and linear regression, ordinary least squares, linear regression, assume that your two variables are on continuum. And so they go from low to high, they go from, you know, potentially a zero if it's a true ratio scale, right, um, to some infinite number of possible values. Now, again, what that means is that there's an infinite number of subdivisions, essentially, that can be made between any two values, right? Okay, so there you go. Now, we will talk about some of these subtypes. Uh, we're not going to talk about other types of regression in this class, but we will talk about other types of correlation. So we'll talk about Pearson's correlation. Pearson is this continuum. We'll talk about Spearman. That's for data that are in order or ranked data, right? An ordinal scale of measurement. Uh, you can also take data that might be continuous, but maybe they are really positively skewed or something. You can always rank that continuous data and then use a Spearman correlation. We'll also talk about correlation like point by serial, which is where you have something that is dichotomous or binary. It means it only takes two values, and you're correlating that with something that is continuous. So like 
gender being correlated with GPA. I can do that with what's called a point by serial, which is really just a special case of the Pearson correlation, it turns out. Finally, we will talk about, but mostly in next lecture, a correlation called phi, and an extension of that called Kramer's phi, which correlates data that are categorical, okay? The relationship between categorical outcomes. We'll focus on that next time. But I want to, want to point out that there are some other correlations that we will see here. They aren't used nearly as often as Pearson's, which is for continuous data. So here, a quick example kind of what this looks like. This is the relationship between some data I took. Uh, I was at a lab where we worked on um, studying cognition at UCSD. And this is some real data, a scatter plot and an ordinary least squares um, line, line. So this is the best fit line basically to get as close to the data as it can as measured by square distance. So you have the mini mental state exam and the MOCA. And so the MOCA is on the y-axis. It's a test that goes from zero to 30. And the MMSC is on the x-axis. It is also a, sports, a test that goes from zero to 30. No one got zero, so it starts here at five. Um, so it doesn't start at the origin, which I probably should have it start at the origin, made it too quickly. Uh, so, and then you have the line that shows the fitted values, okay? And what you see here are scatter plots. So the scatter plots, these dots all represent individual scores. So this is a person who scored, you know, an 11 on the mini mental state exam and a 10 on the MOCA, right? So the, lo the location of a given data point re represents its score on X and its score on Y. In this top left corner here, we see two measures of the relationship between these tests. Now, these tests are both supposed to be brief measures of global cognition. So we would expect them to be related, right? If I have one thing that measures how you think and another thing that's supposed to also measure how you think, we would expect those two things to be related. And in fact, they're very strongly related in this data set. So here we get an R value. This is Pearson's correlation. It is 0.877. Now R can be anywhere from negative one to positive one, okay? And the further it gets from zero in either direction, the stronger the relationship, right? Positive relationships means they change, the variables change together. When one goes up, the other goes up. Negative relationships mean they change in opposite directions. So when one goes up, one goes down. Here we see that when your score gets higher on X, right? So this score is higher than this score on X, right? And when your score goes up on X, right, on this axis, the scores also go up on this axis, right? So here's a score that's very low on X, and it's also very low on Y. But here's a score that's high on X and high on Y. And so you see this general trend is that these scores, when we go up on X, which means go this way across, we go up on Y, which means we go this way up. And so this is a positive correlation. And this is very strong, it's very close to one. It's 0.877. So what we see here are these two measures of cognition are very strongly related. And we can see this visually with the line fit, the scatter plot. We can see this mathematically here with the correlation and above here, this B value. I'm sorry to do this to you, but in statistics, B represents the slope, not the intercept. So back in your old high school equation, B was the intercept, sorry. Here it is the slope, okay? So Bs represent slopes. Beta values is the parameter, their Greek letter B. Um, B is the estimate, which means it belongs to a sample, right? So the B value here shows us that there is also a positive slope. Now, it's hard to say whether this is small, medium, large. You can't really do that with an unstandardized slope coefficient. What we can do is we can say what it actually means in terms of the scores. So what this value tells us is how many units of Y do we go up for a one unit increase in X? One more time. Every time we go up one point on X, what is X here? The mini mental state exam, okay, down here, MMSE. That's our X variable. Every time you get one more point on that test, what do we predict will happen to your score on the Y axis? And it turns out the Y axis is the MOCUS values. So Every time you get one more point on the mini mental state exam, we'll predict you're going to get 1.263 points more on the MOCA. All right, so the slope is the predicted change in Y for a one unit increase in X. Here that means 
the predicted change in your MOCA score for a one point increase on your MMSE score. All right. So the nice thing about the slope is it tells us about the relationships in the original values, right? And the variables we're actually measuring. The nice thing about the correlation coefficient is that it's standardized. So we're able to say, is it small? Is it medium? Is it big? And you're able to do that regardless of what you are measuring. So they both provide something nice um, and together give a very full story about what we expect. So correlation does not assume that there is a predictor and an outcome. Correlation simply says there are two things that are related, but regression does assume an order, an input and an output, a predictor and an outcome. So I've got to pick which one is my predictor and which one is my outcome. A lot of times this is kind of obvious as a function of the research question and the hypothesis. Um, if it's not, you probably should just do a correlation. Right. But a regression does assume an order. It assumes that this thing led to that thing. All right. So this is very important because the answers you'll get in regression are dependent on which variable you specify as X and Y. So you could do all the button clicking right in Excel or Jazz. But if you put the wrong variable in the wrong place, you'll get the wrong answer. And I'll show you some examples of that with some output here in a second. So let's take a look here. We have what's called a correlation matrix. And this is some again, some real data that was taken from some universities in the West, um, looking at graduate student satisfaction with their mentors in psychology. And here I just took two variables from this data. One is how much interest you, does your mentor, mentor have in your future? And the other is how satisfied are you with them? So what I'm asking here is, is how much you think your mentor cares about your future related to how satisfied you are with them? Right. And it would be reasonable to hypothesize that if you think they care about your future, then you're satisfied. That's a reasonable hypothesis. Right. So here what we have in this correlation matrix, we have what are called the autocorrelations here. The autocorrelation is the relationship with a variable to itself. So notice how much interest, how much interest, same variable. So it's going to be perfectly correlated. Right. It's the same thing. This tells us how many people, 92 people answered that question. Now notice on this diagonal, we have the autocorrelations, right? So this is the correlation of satisfaction with satisfaction. 90 people answered that. Now on this other diagonal, we have the relationship that is the correlation we care about, but notice it's duplicated. So whenever you're going to look at, you know, if you have a big correlation matrix to interpret, just cut it down the diagonal and just look at either the bottom half or the top half because they're going to be duplicate. Okay. So here we're just going to look at, you know, these two things in white circles here are the same. We're going to look at this one on the bottom. And here we see a correlation, 0.692. We see the significance, which is the two-tailed p-value, is less than 0 0.001, just truncated here. And we see that 90 people answer both questions. All right, so that's the data we have here. This is the information. Now, this correlation is a very strong and statistically significant correlation. All right, now notice it doesn't matter what the order is. If you call, you know, interest to satisfaction, you get 0.692. If you say satisfaction with interest, you get 0.692 because the correlation doesn't care about the order. It's the same number no matter what. Now, this is not going to be the case with regression. So here we have some examples from regression. Now, notice regression is unstandardized. Um, we'll talk about why that is exactly. It has to do with dividing by the standard deviation. So if you remember from z-scores, when we standardize something, we're dividing by standard deviations. And we're now measuring in these standard deviation units. Okay. So here, the unstandardized slopes right, represent the, the beta coefficient. It's the slope from that regression equation. Okay. In high school, what you learned is y equals mx plus b. Okay. Here we have standardized coefficients. These are, in fact, look at the same thing as the correlation. And notice, in both of these outputs, so I want you to see the dependent variable. Here, the dependent variable, which is the outcome, or y, is satisfaction. Here, the dependent variable is interest. So I flipped which variable is the y in these cases. Okay, That's super critical here for regression, trying to get this point across. So when I change which variable is x and y, what happens to the unstandardized slope? Well, here it's 0.744, here it's 0.644. So notice these answers are different. The intercepts, the slopes have changed 
Okay. Now, what hasn't changed is the standardized one because that is the correlation. And what hasn't changed is the significance test because it's still the same relationship, but it's being expressed differently. So what does that mean? One, be sure to put your X and Y variables in correctly for regression or you will get the wrong answer. Two, be sure you understand what this number represents. Again, it is the predicted change in Y for a one unit increase in X. So here in this top blue box, this is Y is satisfaction. X is interest in future. So what I'm asking is, what is the predicted change in satisfaction for a one unit increase in interest in future? And I would predict satisfaction will go up by 0.744 points when interest in future goes up by one point. That's what this says. Okay. Now down here in the yellow box, this is how much interest in future is Y. X is satisfaction. Okay. Please pay attention to that. When you interpret these output, it's important to realize what's what. Okay, now, this says if satisfaction in the future goes up one point, I'll predict an increase in interest goes up 0.64, four points. All right, so one unit increase in satisfaction with my mentor predicts a 0.64, four point increase in interest in future. Does that make sense? So they're not the same thing because you're asking a different question. One question is, how much does satisfaction go up if interest goes up? The other is, how much does interest go up if satisfaction goes up? That's a different question. And it matters that unstandardized, so they're in the original units. Your unstandardized slope is always in the Y units. So what does that mean? However your dependent variable is measured is how the unstandardized slope is measured. So here, the dependent variable is satisfaction with mentor. So these are satisfaction points. The slope is satisfaction points. It is the a satisfaction point increase for a one unit increase in interest. Here, this is now in interest points, right? How much interest in future? So this is how many interest points will go increase for a one unit increase in satisfaction. So that's critical to understand. Okay, so last, let's take a look at the math, right? get some sense of this. We'll look at how to do it with a small data set in Excel. Um, I'm, you know, you can do it all by hand. Again, it, like a lot of these are the same concepts. The idea of like sums of squares is very important here still, all these types of things. Okay, but what I want you to get is that doing it by hand is, is easy to make a mistake. It's important to understand the math to be able to understand why the math tells us something, right? Math tells us something. The reason it tells us something is because the process. Now, I want to go through the process, but, uh, you know, doing it all by hand is probably not necessary for you uh, to spend a bunch of your time doing, but I want you to understand what's going on. So let's take a look. So let's talk about how covariance turns into correlation. And I think this most importantly starts if you remember what variance is. Okay, so variance, if you remember, is derived by doing math that gets us sum of squares. So I'm going to pull over some data. And let's just do a quick example here. Okay, let's just do variance to try to remind ourselves how this works. So here's a set of data, and I'm just going to use these Y variables. So I've got 20 scores here. Okay, now, if I want to get the variance for these scores, how does that start? It starts by getting the sum of squares. What is the sum of squares? Well, let's walk through long version here, a reminder of what sum of squares is, and then we'll show you how to get it quickly. Okay. So sum of squares, the first thing is, it's the sum of squared deviations. So we need a deviation. A deviation is the score on Y minus the mean, which is Y bar. Okay, so that's the deviation. Okay, so the first thing we need to know is what is the mean? So we can get the average for our set of data. So there's the average for our set of data. Okay, our data is in, oh, sorry, let me put B here. Our data are in B, 2 to 21, right? Now we see this highlighted, okay? So our average is 4.65. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a score, and we're going to subtract the mean. And we're going to do that for all of these. Now here I'm going to use this dollar sign to lock in place the mean, because you're always going to subtract the mean from every score. So 1 minus 4.65 is negative 3.65, okay? Right? That's the deviation. Now, I'll get those deviations for that whole set by clicking and dragging. So there are my deviations. Now, 
I need to what? I need to square those deviations. So here I'm going to take that and I'm going to add to this power 2. We're going to square the deviations. Okay? So this now is going to be a score times a score, or you could also write that as squared, right? So we're going to square the deviation, and we're going to do that for the whole series. So there are the squared deviations. And now, if we sum the squared deviations, this is our sum of squares. Okay? Now, if you remember, there's a fast way to get that in Excel. It is d square, and you just use your original data. You're getting the square deviations for that set of data, and there we see it's the same number, right? 178.55. Okay, so we have here our sum of squares. Now, the sum of squares is what leads us to be able to get variance. Now, if you remember, the variance has a degree of freedom. So it's the sum of squares divided by a degree of freedom, right? So variance is sum of squares divided by df. Now, for a sample, the df is n minus 1. So if we take our sum of squares and we divide by the sample size, which is the count of scores, how many scores do we have, right? And we're going to subtract 1. I'm going to put all that in parentheses for order of operations. So there's our df term. So this is our sample variance, okay? So it's our sample variance. I'm just going to use the Excel notation here, var s. It would just be s squared in typical notation, right? Sample variance. All right. There'd be an easy way to get that sample variance. If you do var dot s and you just use your original data, that's the short way to do this in Excel. We'll see that those are, again, the same number. And these are our variance term. Okay, so this is variance. So sum of squares and variance, this is what it comes from. It comes from doing this process with one set of values, one variable, okay? So we only use y here. We didn't use a y and an x, okay? That's important to understand. So let's take a look now at what we're moving towards. So we remember variance, we just went through it. Now we're talking about correlation uses a covariance. Co, two things. Notice we have an x and a y variable. Notice here we have x minus the mean, y minus the mean. So we have the deviations for x and the deviations for y divided by n minus 1. Okay? So here, what this is doing for us is it's saying if a score is different from the mean on x, how is, that, how is that same person, right, how is their y score different from the average of y? So say we're doing height and weight. Say that height is x and weight is y. If I find some person who is, say, below average in height, are they also below average in weight? If they are, what happens? We get, a, so they're below average, so we're going to get a negative x and a negative y. When you multiply those together, you're going to get a positive, right? So, and these are the averages, right? We're going to sum this and we're going to divide. So the covariance is basically the average uh, sum of square cross product here, okay? So here we have x, y, how you deviate from x, does that relate to how you deviate on y? So if somebody, say, is below average weight and above average height, you're going to have a negative sign and a positive sign. You're going to get a negative term, right? So covariance can be negative or positive, unlike variance. Variance can only be positive because whenever you multiply something by itself, it's positive, right? Negative times negative, positive. But here, you can have a negative and a positive. And this is why covariance and then why correlation can have direction. Because you can have a negative covariance, which would tell you that deviations on one variable, you know, are the opposite direction of deviations on the other variable. Okay? So... This is what we're using now, is this covariance. It's the same idea. You get deviations for x, deviations for y, multiply, and sum. All right? So we can go through that process, and we can show you how you can get that value in Excel. Okay? So let's pull up our data set here, and I'm going to slide over. We're going to get rid of what we calculated, and we're going to use some new data. Okay, so now we have x and y. All right, so now we're going to have to get deviation scores for x and deviation scores for y. y minus y bar. 
Okay, so we have x minus x bar and y minus y bar here to make it easier to read. We'll add spaces. Hopefully that provides clarity that x bar is a term, right? Remember, x bar is the, how we say sample mean. Okay, so here what we're going to do, and I'm going to streamline this a bit. I'm going to put the average within the calculation. So we're going to do a score minus the average of the score. So of A2 through A21, okay? So there is our, this is going to be X is A2, X bar is the average of all those scores, and we're just going to drag that through. Okay, now we should be able to drag this across, and notice what will happen is it'll go to B. Okay, so here we have our X, and here we have our Y. Okay, so now what we need to do is multiply these. So we can use some product, if you want to, to do this fast. And we can select our two arrays. I can walk through this long bit, version too. So there's our sum product, but if we were to do this long version, what did that just do? Okay, it just did this times this, okay? And then it did that for all of them. And then we would get the sum of all of them. Right there, okay? So again, the other command I used, and so this is the, the sum products of the, the deviations, okay? So abbreviated a lot of times SP. Um, and notice that you can get this, once you've got these deviations, you can use this command sum product in Excel, and you can select your two arrays rather than doing the whole thing, um, which I did here to demo exactly what was happening in the background here for the math. And notice that these are all the same thing. Okay, so there's our sum of pro uh, cross products um, with the deviations, okay? And so this is the numerator in your covariance term. And then for a sample covariance, you do n minus 1. We have 20 scores, so we divide by 19. Now in Excel, you can get covariance as a sample covariance, which is dividing by n minus 1, or as a population, which is dividing by n. Most of the time, we'll want to use the sample one. So to do that, you can just select your original data to get this covariance term. Okay. There we go. Now what this covariance term should be is it should be this term divided by our, so this is our sample covariance, and we should be able to get this same term if we take what we calculated long way and we divide it by the degrees of freedom, which is the count of how many scores we have. Now you don't count 40. You count just because you, each of these x, y, they characterize one case, right? So it's like your height and your weight, how are they related, right? They're not like 20 people's heights and 20 people's weights. So you have 20 people here and you measure two things about them. I think that's important to realize. So your count, you have 20 cases, okay? So we're gonna get that count and we're gonna divide by one and there you go. So here we see long way and short way that we get that covariance term. You can use the direct command in Excel for the sample covariance or we can calculate this all out. Now what you should realize is that what we just did is this process. We did this. Okay, because we got, again, we'll look at it real quick next to it here. What did we do? So we have X and we have Y. We took the deviations around X, that's this term, and the deviations around Y, that's this term, right? Then what did we do? Well, we've got to multiply those terms. So we multiplied those terms, that's this right here, okay? Then we have to sum, sigma, sum those terms, that's this right here, okay? So this is our numerator, that SP term here, okay? Now to turn that into covariance, sample covariance, you divide by n minus 1. So that's what we did here when we took this number and divided by 19, 20 minus 1, right? So if we just did this whole process, that's how you would get covariance, all right? Now this covariance term is what turns into a correlation. So we'll pick back up with our data examples here in a second to show you that, okay? So the correlation... You take the covariance and you divide by the standard deviation of x, multiply by the standard deviation of y. So now it's standardized. It'll always be between 0 and 1. This is what we call Pearson's R. The parameter population value would be rho. Okay, so if you wrote a hypothesis about a correlation, the, the hypothesis would be about rho. Um, but then when you compute an actual value for a sample, it is R, a correlation. 
So you would take that x to y covariance, which we just got done calculating, and you would divide by standard deviation of x and standard deviation of y. So here is our covariance, right? Now let's take a quick look. If we, so remember, all our, I'll, I'll make it big here for a second. All of our data for x and y are in a and b. Did everybody see that? So let's just break this into pieces here real fast. If we get the standard deviation, sample standard deviation for x, okay, and sample standard deviation for y, I'm just going to bring it across. Notice now this command is for b instead of a updated. Right there, you see that? Okay, so these are our standard deviations. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this covariance and we're going to divide it by these standard deviations multiplied together. Okay, so our correlation here should be our covariance term divided by this times this. Okay, so here's our correlation. Now, we can also get a correlation quickly in Excel. There's the command corral. There's also a command for Pearson, specifically called Pearson. They will get you the same thing. I don't care which one you want to do. I'll do both to show you. For this, you would just use your original data. So I'm showing you the steps so you understand what the math is doing. But Excel has commands, basically, for all of these things. So there you go. And if I were to use that corral command instead here, I'm telling you it'll be the same thing. Now I'm showing you that it's the same thing. Bam. All right. So there are our correlation values. And so this one we computed long way, right? We did the deviations. We multiplied the deviations. We summed the multiplied deviations to get some products. We took that. And what did we do? We divided it by the degrees of freedom to get the sample covariance. We take that sample covariance. We divide it by the standard deviation of X multiplied by the standard deviation of Y to get the correlation. So that's a long way. You can, of course, get all these values much more briefly if you'd like to in Excel. But that demos the exact process the math is doing. And the reason this all makes sense is because those deviations around X and Y, right, they tell you, is it changing together or is it changing opposite, right? How much are they changing? And then when you standardize them by dividing by those standard deviations, it makes it such that you will always have a R value between negative and positive 1. And so now you are always able to talk about, is this small, medium, or large? You can easily make that assessment. So here, this Pearson's correlation would have two degrees of freedom if you wanted to look it up for significance. Now, uh, it's easy to look up for significance, for example, in GraphPad. We can pull up GraphPad if you remember it. You can look it up in a table in your book. You can, you can look it up long way in Excel. There's all kinds of ways you can do it. Um, so if we go to GraphPad and we go to Quick Calcs, uh, we can look at p-values from statistical distributions. And notice you can get a p-value from an R. So we hit Continue. And here we've got R. And we just calculated our R value as a reminder is negative 0.287. We're going to round to those four decimal places. 0.287. So negative 0.0287. And we have 20 minus 2, so 18 degrees of freedom, right? 20 cases, right? We had 20x, 20y scores. So 20 minus 2, 18, compute. And this is not significant, which isn't surprising because these were data I made up using random number generators. So they shouldn't be related. <laughs> okay, so here we have a correlation with degrees of freedom and its p-value, 0.9044, not statistically significant. So our x and y variable that we just made up for demo, not related statistically. All right, that is the math, the process there for correlation. Now, what about regression? Okay, so if you remember, we talked about regression basically connects back to that y equals mx plus b idea, which is the slope equation you should have learned in high school, or at least heard about. Whether or not you learned it, that's on you. So, so we are doing the exact same thing, but stats, we write it with different letters. It's not my fault. I didn't make it up. The y is the, y, the score on the y-axis. x is the score on the x-axis. So y and x are the actual variable values, right? So those are in your data set, okay? A here is the intercept, okay? It is the predicted score on y when x is zero. How do I know that? Well, let's just take a look. Okay, so if x is zero, what's any number multiplied by zero? 
Hopefully you just said zero. Yeah. Okay. So that means this whole BX thing disappears, right? Because it all becomes zero. So now Y equals A. Ta-da! So the intercept is the predicted value on Y when X is zero, right? Which is, okay, there you go. So the slope is the relationship. So this is this B value, the slope is the relationship. And the relationship always has to be connected to the X variable, right? Because it's always a function. It's how does Y change when X changes? So that means it's got to be connected, tied to X. So no matter what letters people use, you should always realize when everything is attached to the X, that's the slope. When everything is standing all on its own, that's the intercept. Okay? Okay. So when people wrote Y equals MX plus B, the intercept was B. It was all on its own. The thing that was connected to X was M. M was the slope. Okay? So same idea here. People might write these with, in different ways. Some people might use Greek letters when you're writing actual like population models and parameters and stats and stuff. But just keep in mind, whatever's attached to X is the slope. Whatever is on its own, outside on its own. And it can, a lot of times it'll be first because it's your starting point. So it doesn't matter where it's at in the math equation either. All that matters is it's all on its own. It's not connected to something else. This is connected to X. They're connected, right? This is all on its own. The thing that's all on its own has got to be the intercept. Okay, so... The slope here is the predicted change in y for a one unit change in x. So say that, you know, the intercept is zero. So when x is zero, y is zero. All right. So now we can basically say y equals bx. With me? Okay. So say that you have a b value where your slope is one. So if x is zero, right? So you have one times zero plus zero, that's zero plus zero, y is zero. What happens if we have a one unit increase in x? So now x becomes one. So now we have one times one plus zero, right? Let's, here, I'll, I'll do this so we can track a little better. Okay, so we, we said that we have y equals, the slope value is one times x, plus an intercept that is zero. Okay? So, this is what we said. Now, if we say that x is one, so we have y equals one times one plus zero. Okay? Then y equals one. Right? Everybody see that? Now, what if we go up one unit on x? So what if we make this 1 a 2? Okay? So now, our slope is still 1. Our x value is now a 2. And our intercept would be 0 still. So now we have y equals 1 times 2 plus 0. So now y equals 2. So what you see here is that when x goes up one unit, so it goes from being a one to being a two for our x value here. When that goes up one unit, what is the predicted change in y? Well, it went from being a one to being a two. And that is exactly what this slope value tells us. The predicted change in y for a one unit change in x. Okay, so hopefully that makes some sense. That's exactly what we're doing here. All right, so. This is the regression slope equation. Now, how do we do calculations for this? Okay, now there's actually a couple ways you can get at this. You can take some products and divide by the sum of squares for x to get your slope. You want to start by getting your slope. You can also take your correlation and multiply it by the standard deviation of y divided by the standard deviation of x. Okay, uh, you can also think about this technically. You can take the covariance and divide it by the variance of x. Okay, so I'm going to use that approach because that would be the same thing as this. These are these are the sums, whereas the covariance and the variance are the averages or the means. Okay, so if you can do any of those different equations, I think that the easiest to use here is going to be to use the covariance and variance terms. So we'll use that real quick to, to demo our example with our Excel data. So we got the covariance already. So what we need is the variance of x, right, to get the slope. So if we do the sample variance, make sure you use your x variable. Okay, so now if we get our covariance, 
and we divide it by our variance x, so this is var x, we get this value right here. And this value is b, which is again the slope. So that's the relationship. Okay, now again, notice the covariance, the correlation, the slope, they're all negative. They need to all have the same sign or you did something wrong. Now we should get the same number if we take the correlation and we multiply by standard deviation of y divided by standard deviation of x. So we can also get the slope, for example, by taking the correlation we calculated and we're going to multiply it by the standard deviation of y, which we calculated here, divide by the standard deviation of x, which we calculated here, and we get the same value. Now again, same math, you can also get this thing if you do the sum of products, sp, and you divide it by the sum of squares for x. So here, if we have the sum of products, and we divide by, I'm going to just put the command in here, d square, so the sum of squares for x, we get the same number. Bam. All right, so like I said, like technically there's more than one way to get this value, but that slope value, you can get out like that, and that slope, is the relationship so it's the predicted change in y for a one unit change in x and you can get at it all those different ways because mathematically the same thing whether you use the the means or the sums like doesn't matter they're both just being divided by that 19 right that same degree of freedom term so like you can just avoid doing that but these are all the same thing you can use whatever mean like whatever process makes the most sense for you i'll show you how to run a regression quickly to check all these values in excel in one moment the next calculation we would need to do is how do we get the intercept? And the intercept can be calculated, right? When you, you want to calculate the intercept, you're solving for it. You take the average on y, so y bar, and then the slope multiplied by x bar, the average. Okay, so we need the averages. So we're going to get down here the average for x, and then we're going to get the average for y. So there they are. This is the average score on X, this is the average score on Y, so we can put those in our equation. So we have now that A equals 4.65 minus our slope, which is negative 0 0.03164 times 5.05. Okay, so that's what we're solving. So let's do that now. So 4.65 minus slope times and that is your intercept so that's the a value or intercept so our regression equation now we've just solved the whole regression equation so remember our regression equation is y equals a plus bx or if you want you can say y equals bx plus a i really don't care well i normally write y plus uh, a, a plus bx, I normally start with the intercept, it's your starting point, but anyway. So this is our regression equation, and now we have the numbers that can go into this equation. So our regression equation here, if we want to predict someone's y-score, here's what it is. It is going to be intercept 4.8098 plus, and I'm just doing that just to make it clear, negative 0.03164 times their score on x. That is the regression equation. We just solved it. So what this tells us, if we wanted to say, well, what score on y would we expect for somebody who has an x score of, you know, 5? Okay, so what we would say is, okay, we can predict that. We're going to predict intercept plus slope times their score, right, on x, which was 5. So times 5. Okay, so now we can predict their y score from their x score, and we would predict that if they had a 5 on x, they would have a 4.65 on y. Notice how those numbers are very close to these means? Uh, yeah, these are at the mean. Now, if I if I were to have a different, what if I wanted to say an x score for someone who scored, someone has an x score of 12, what's their y? Notice there are no 12s in here, right? Um, so if you have an x score of 12, what do I predict you have for y? I predict your score is 4.43, right? Notice this was a negative correlation. So when x goes up, y goes down, okay? So this is how you would use the regression equation. This is how you get it. Now you can get this all very quickly in Excel using that data analysis function we talked about before.
So if you go to your data tab and you do your data analysis and you select regression, make sure you pick the right order, right? So my Y variable is in B, so B1 to B20. Well, move down. So B2 to 21. And my X score, so notice it has a Y and X. Make sure you align them correctly. And then I'm going to stick my output uh, down here so that I can kind of see it compared to everything else. And this is going to just run my regression for me. And as long as I put in the values in the right way, I should be good. So let's see what we find. Okay, so we have our test. Intercept, 4.8098. Ta-da! It matches what we calculated. Slope. Ta-da! It matches what we calculated. Correlation. So here is the correlation value. Now, the multiple R won't have a sign on it, okay? Uh, because you can do a regression with more than one variable, so it's just, it's always positive um, in this thing. But what you'll notice is it's going to be the same value, right? It just doesn't have the negative sign. So there you go. The p-value that we looked up previously, we looked this p-value up in GraphPad for the correlation. Notice that same p-value there with that same 18 degrees of freedom. Okay? So there you go. We ran the whole regression. What we find is that this is not statistically significant. So notice, you have your intercept. Now the test of the intercept, it has a p-value, but you do not care about this p-value. Right? This p-value is just asking, is your intercept not zero? I really don't care. I don't care about this t-test, and I don't care about this p-value. I care about these ones, okay? Because those ones are the ones that tell me about x and y. And my question is, are x and y related? So the slope is what tells me that. So here, I have the x variable, and I have the t and p-value. And it is not statistically significant. Why? Because 0.90... 0.9044 is greater than 0.05, right? So this is not significant. I would retain null, okay? So there you go. That's how you can do this whole regression process, the math that underlies it, and how you can even get it kind of quickly if you use data analysis in Excel so we can check and make sure that, hey, yeah, we did all this the right way. So beautiful. So that's the regression. That's how we make sense of it. So the significance, right, your hypothesis is always that X and Y are related, right? And so the relationship, that slope, the p-value for that slope is what tells you whether or not it's statistically significant, all right? And that will tell you whether there is a relationship between X and Y. Now, as we talked about, Pearson's correlation has both direction and magnitude, okay? So the direction is negative or positive. Right? The slopes can be negative or positive as well. And magnitude is how large it is. So it's kind of like this guy. Alright. So, just like that, right? Direction and magnitude. So, here we go. Pearson's correlation. Direction. Is it negative or is it positive? Okay, that's all that matters. Okay, so if you're trying to look at a correlation and you have a hard time keeping it straight, what I want you to do is I want you to think of it like this. So I've got some correlation. I'm going to separate these things just to kind of make it easier to look at. Okay, so I've got some correlation that's negative 0.57. And I've got some correlation that's positive 0.45. And some correlation that's negative... 0.32 and some correlation that's positive 0.71. Okay, so I'm going to slide these all so that they touch so they look like they're a single thing, but demonstrate my point here. Direction is over here, magnitude is over here. Okay? All right. So, when you want to know about the direction of the correlation, is the direction is the correlation positive or negative, right? Do they change together or do they change separately? then you can ignore this thing altogether, okay? So when I want to know about direction, this stuff doesn't even matter to me. So you can just, like, cover it up. Okay, so the direction. I have a negative, positive, negative, and positive. Okay, so those are the directions of the correlation. Now, when I want to know about the strength of the correlation or the magnitude, I can cover the direction of it. It doesn't matter to me. Bam. 
So now I just got to say, which of those numbers is bigger? Okay, well, 0.71 is the largest, so that's my largest correlation, right? But then my smallest correlation is 0.32, okay? But notice 0.57 is a bigger correlation than 0.45, even though it's negative. So a lot of people want to say, oh, it's negative. It's a small correlation. No, 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 no. That's the direction. Those, those signs, they don't matter at all. The correlation is about the absolute value in terms of magnitude. So 0.57 is a stronger correlation than 0.45. It doesn't matter that one's negative and one's positive. Okay, so hopefully that's clear. So the strongest is absolute value of one. A negative one is just as strong as a positive one correlation. The weakest is zero. Zero means zero relationship, no relationship. So if you look at these things graphically, it looks something like this. So that, again, they range from negative to positive one. And if you have a perfect correlation, every time X goes up, Y goes up in the same manner. Bam, 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 bam. Perfect, right? Perfect slope, right? In real worlds, you don't get this perfect slope. You get stuff like this, where there's like clearly a trend in here, but it's not perfect, right? When you have no correlation, you can't like, okay, when I'm going up on X, I don't see it going up on Y. Like there's just a like, bunch of data here with no clear pattern to it. So these negative and positive one correlations, they're perfect. They don't tend to exist in the real world. Only auto correlations, positive one, right? Because they're related, how related a variable is to itself is perfect. But our data in the real world tend to look like this or like this. Okay? So we get these modest correlations. They can be negative. Notice on a negative one, when X is going, X is getting bigger as we're going to the right here. But as, as we go to the right, what happens to Y? It goes down. So when X increases, Y decreases. Okay, so positive correlations, they change in the same direction, which would mean that when I go up on X, I go up on Y, which is also to say that if I go down on X, I go down on Y, right? So two negatives are a positive. Two positives are a positive. A negative correlation means that they go in opposite directions. So if I go up on X, I go down on Y. And if I go down on X, I actually go up on Y. All right. So if you said the more time you spend studying, the higher your grades, that's a positive correlation. If you said something like the, the more time you spend with your friends, the less depressed you are, that's a negative correlation. All right. So in the simplest form, we're assuming linearity that these things change in a straight line pattern. Right. We're not going to try to make curves through this stuff. OK. So general conventions. Not everyone agrees exactly about the conventions. I took this from Jacob Cohen's paper um, and often considered kind of the standard. A small correlation is 0.1, a medium is 0.3, and a large is 0.5. Abouts. Again, not everyone agrees on these exactly. They're rules of thumb. They are not laws. Okay, so hopefully the slope equation makes some sense and you see that this is all the same thing as what you used to do, just with different letters. All right? And hopefully you're able to interpret some of those values uh, that we saw in things like a correlation matrix, right, where you get the correlation value and the significance value, and then also in things like regression outputs, where you care about the B value that goes with the variable, and you care about the P value that goes with it. That's what we care about because that's the test of the relationship. So hopefully that helps you understand a little bit about correlation and regression.